Today's episode is brought to you by the Frankenmuth Convention and Visitors Bureau. Come plan your vacation at frankenmuth.org. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Call of Leadership podcast, where we interview people from our Michigan community who answered the call of leadership. We all hear their stories and get their advice so we can be better leaders for ourselves, our families, and our communities. I am your host, Cliff Duvinois, and today's guest, I'm happy to say, the president and CEO of Bronner's Christmas Wonderland, and that is Wayne Bronner. Wayne, welcome to the show. How are you? We are fine and a happy 186 days before Christmas. <laughs> Definitely. And I, 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 this episode is going to be so heavily Christmas themed. I absolutely love it. So let's take a little bit trip back in time. You were born and raised in Frankenmuth? Correct. When did your father start Bronner's? Well, my father started Bronner's uh, in 1945, really. And it wasn't a Christmas business. He, he knew that from working in his father's trade, which was masonry, that that was not what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a sign painter and a window trimmer. So actually the story was he was painting a sign in Jenison Hardware Store, and some people from Clare, Michigan came in, and they inquired of the owner of the hardware store whether he had any Christmas decorations for sale. And he said, no, we don't have anything like that. Why don't you talk to that young window trimmer? That was my dad, Wally, at the age of 18. So he painted uh, for the village of Clare some Christmas panels, and they hung them from their lampposts. And they were so well received by so many communities that people ask, where did you get those? And they said, from a young sign painter down there in Frankenmuth, Michigan. His name was Wally Bronner. And that was really the start of the Christmas business. Excellent. And, and what was it about, because I know you said that was the start, but what do you know what the, what the precipitating thought was that made him say, wow, I can make a a full business out of it. <laughs> I think it was a realization that there was just wasn't availability of Christmas decorations on the market. So he did some exploration, had a survey done, and there were very little Christmas decorations available, and he capitalized on that. So that's wonderful. Because I can imagine that probably for a lot of towns or villages, when they're making their Christmas Christmas plans, they're doing it two, three, maybe even four months ahead of time. They're planning out a long time in advance. Yes. Yeah. So probably back then. Today, it seems like I'm seeing Christmas decorations in <laughs> September at the stores. So I'm up early. Yeah, that they do. That they certainly do. I know this is a this is a family business because your your father ran it for a number of years, and and now you're you're at the helm. What was it that attracted you to sit there and say, "I'm going to assume the mantle of the family business and run it myself"? That's interesting. I was actually a wildlife biologist for for about ten years. I worked for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Started in 1974. In 1983, I came up here to join the business because I assumed that it was going to be a, a very viable undertaking. So it's a tremendous business, and it's grown steadily throughout the years. What made you decide to, to go into wildlife bi biology? Well, I was a young boy, and I was just destined to be a wildlife biologist. So that's <laughs> what I became. Excellent. And where did you study? So I studied at Michigan State University, got my degree in wildlife biology, and I went from taking care of white-tailed deer to taking care of Rudolph. Excellent. And when you started getting back into the the, the family business, did was this something where you just said to yourself, you know what, one day I am going to take this over? What was the transition plan like? What was your training for that? For going from biology, going into retail is, is quite a leap. It's quite a, quite a stretch, but it's a, it's a natural occurrence. And really working with my father here, that was a tremendous training exercise. He was a dedicated man, a very Christian man, and he had a good philosophy about Bronner's. And 1997, he made the transition that we took over for the family, family business. I became the president and CEO, and my sisters became the vice presidents. And then my dad went to heaven in 2008, and we've been running Bronner's ever since. Can you share with us kind of like what your father's philosophy was? His philosophy was every every guest is a visitor, and they, and no matter what their what their role in life is, everybody has a tremendous value. I really saw that in particular on international trips. He was he didn't know the language in a lot of times, a lot of countries. But he would uh, just have an urge to get people to smile. So it might be elevator, it might be a vendor, and so forth. And he would go through his gyrations here to get them to smile. Right. And when you're doing these international travels, 
Was there anybody that gave you kind of any odd looks when you said, we're going to have a Christmas store that's just open 360 some odd days every single year? They like to take our orders. They knew we were, <laughs> we were good, good as cash. Because money always talks. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. What do you think it is about having a Christmas store that is open, like year round, like in the middle of July, not paying very, very many people are thinking about Christmas, but yet your store still attracts a lot of people. What is, what is it that you think that, that draws people to? I think people have an, a positive association with Christmas. When you think about it, there's really nothing negative about Christmas. It's all about positive interactions with friends, family, relatives, and so forth. And that brings out the best in people, and they like to share it all year long. Yeah, excellent. And for that, was there, was there any particular memories from your family? that you think about maybe when you're walking through Bronner's or anything that, that you would like to share? It's, it's, it's a, a business of Christmas, and all of a sudden it hits me about three days before Christmas, there's a personal side to Christmas also. Right. So we think about the personal Christmases as we've celebrated, and our tradition is we like to go to my parents' house, and you know, it's my, grand, my, my mother, I should say, grandma, uh, from our boy's perspective, and we go to her house on Christmas Eve, and we sing Christmas carols, and... Just set, kind of celebrate and enjoy each other's company. Excellent. This is something that you've just done year after year? If we've done it year after year, it's a tradition. Excellent. When when you're talking about having the store open and the people are coming in and visiting, has there been any, like, what are like what are some of the countries? Because I know you're, you're known throughout the world. What are some of the countries that maybe have surprised you that people have been here to Brawners? We have a lot of people that come, the international people, people from around the globe, actually. And probably one of the more surprising thing is people from the Muslim countries and the Hindu countries, ah. and, and they come to see what Christmas is all about. And they come here to experience it. Right, right. Excellent. Because yeah. they know we celebrate Christmas, and they want to see what's involved in celebrating Christmas. On your floor, you have Christmas decorations literally from around the globe. What was the idea of transitioning Bronner's from purely focusing like as as an American holiday versus like a global holiday. Like if I want to go out and get an ornament from France, I can find it on your floor. Yes. So what what was the idea of transitioning that to an international store? Well, we buy 50,000 different items and trims. That's what you're going to see on our floor. And we have about a changeover of, of, of a third of those items every year. So we source internationally from around the globe and buy a variety of Christmas decorations and people, you never know where they're from, but they, they like to see the Christmas decorations that are capitalizing on their country. Has anyone ever walked up to you and said, I am from X country and I can't believe you have this ornament from my country here? <laughs> we get that a lot. Yeah, that's, that's quite surprising. A lot of people don't know the Christmas decorations are made in their country. And when they find them here at Bronner's are quite intrigued. I bet. And that probably gets you a lot of publicity out on social media and everything else when people are snapping photos. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. The social media has been very good to us. How many people actually come through Bronner's? About 2 million year? visitors per year is what we Seriously? calculate. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Excellent. Has there been anybody for you being the, the president and CEO of the company and the training that you learned, has there been anybody that has, that has inspired you as a leader? Yeah, probably my father, actually. Because he, he was an origin, originator of Bronner's, and he had never had any idea that it was going to grow to be the world's largest Christmas store. In fact, he was just happy to get out of the masonry business, like I mentioned earlier. So he was a sign trimmer, a sign painter, I should say, and a window trimmer, and he capitalized on the Christmas business. So I, I follow his lead tremendously. And he, he emphasized also that Christmas is a, a very sacred time. It's about the birth of Jesus Christ, and we should never forget that. And if you come to Bronner's, it's pretty obvious what we believe. Exactly. Is there any, perhaps, piece of advice that your father gave you that you still use to this day? He, the, the advice is treat everybody the same and treat everybody well. So... People come from a wide, wide variety of distances, and no matter whether somebody comes from the local town of Tuscola or if they come from far away, Saudi Arabia or China and so forth, treat them all the same. And have you ever sat back and, and just marveled 
at the fact that you've got 2 million people that are coming through the door. Like, how in the world did this ever happen? That's really amazing when you think about it. Frankenmuth only has a population of 5,000 people. So to attract 2 million visitors per year, that's really quite unique. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Is there... With regards to with regards to your with your job, has there ever been a time where somebody has walked up to you and and has said, you know, wow, what you're doing here has has really impacted my family, or really brought back a special memory? Has anybody shared anything like that with you? Yeah, we we hear that all the time. So a lot of times when we're particularly busy, I'd like to spend a lot of time out there on the floor, and my father will tell the stories. He knew the grandparents, and he knew the the, the parents and you know, the grandchildren and so forth. So he's known them for a long, long time. And people find it a tradition to come up to Bronner's and to come to Frankenmuth to experience it. Is there any particular one story that stands out to you? I can't think of one, but I, we've heard it repeatedly that, that Bronner's has, really has an impact on, on people. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. Because I know that uh, there's a lot of families, and, and I was actually part of that this last year with my fiance. They have a Every single year, they've got a tradition. They pile up everybody in the family, and they come over here. And the, well, the the young ones aren't so young anymore, but you know, sitting on Santa's lap and getting their picture taken and and everything else. What do you what do you think it is about the the Bronners that people actually make traditions around coming here? I think what they like to see a small town atmosphere. Actually, I describe myself as uh, being part of Ozzy and Harriet's culture, and <laughs> nice. the younger people they say, "Who are Ozzy and Harriet?" So they don't know, but it really, it's a small town environment, and the town is doing very well, and people like to experience it. And speaking of small town, is there any particular reason why that your father decided to build the store here in Frankenmuth? He was a Frankenmuth native, and this was the logical place to build a store. He and, has a very short commute to work every day. And of course, the success of Zenders and Bavarian Inn, two of the largest restaurants in the world, actually. And then Bronner's being the world's largest Christmas store, so we we're known as the Big Three of Frankenmuth. So I do want to I do want to make sure that we talk about this that with regards to uh, COVID nineteen and everything being shut down and closed, you've just recently reopened. Right, we opened of, on June tenth. As of June tenth, with regards to you know people coming out and and obviously I think if anybody needs Christmas spirit now, it's just about everybody on the planet after being trapped in home for three months. What are some of the what are some of the, the the policies and procedures that you have in place that people can come and enjoy your store, be able to kind of like experience that little bit of Christmas, but yet be able to keep their family safe? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So Frankenmuth is a good outing, and it's a very safe place, and we pride ourselves on a safety, and all of the governor's stipulations on the governor's orders are followed, and we follow the CDC guidelines in effect. And we follow also the Saginaw County Department of Health and my OSHA. So all of those are in fact in effect. And visitors wear masks, so we highly encourage them to wear masks. And you're going to see a lot of plexiglass. We're very good customers of plexiglass. So that plexiglass sheeting protects people from waiting in, in, our, in our high traffic areas. And we have hand sanitizers throughout the store. In addition, we have these buttons here that urge people to keep a six-foot distance here. So we have a wide variety of protections. And excellent. And what are you doing to help spread the word that Bronner's is back open again? Well, through, through social media primarily. Yes, okay. yes. Excellent. Yeah, and people come to visit Frankenmuth. They like a good outing. They've been cooped up for a long time, and they want to get out. Sure. It's a good time of year to do it. When the COVID-19 was first coming around— and you guys made the decision to actually close down Bronner's probably before the governor issued the stay-at-home order? We were closed about a week beforehand, yes. Yeah. What was it like to make that decision? I mean, you're, you know, a lot of, like you said, a lot of people come here. A lot of people, you know, this is, you know, some place to them to, to recapture memories. What was it like to actually say, sorry, we have to close our doors? It was quite unique. So that was the first time in over our 75-year history that we've actually had to close. So that was a sad occasion. And we've been closed now for the better part of three months. Because you're only closed a few days of the year, if I remember correctly. Open, you're open 361 days a year. And then you were closed for almost three months? We have, right, right. We were closed for three months. Runs order. Yeah. 
And and during that time, what was the, you know, what was the attitude amongst uh, your staff? Because I know a lot of people, I mean, it impacts people's ability to go out and shop, but it also impacts people's job as well. So what was your reaction from the staff when, when you had to stand up and say, look, this is, this is the right thing for us to do? Yeah, they understood. Yeah, they, they was logical. We had the governor's order, of course, and it was mandated that we close and we would want to close anyhow because of the, the pandemic. So there was a situation where people got unemployment and uh, they they capitalized on that. And it was a very unfortunate situation. We have a lot of dedicated people here. Our, the average seniority of our, of our supervisors and our managers is over 20 years. So got a lot of, lot of experience. That is impressive. What is the... What is the culture like here that makes people want to stay for so long? They they tell us that it's a great place to work. So we've never worked elsewhere, and it's it's encouraging to see that in the, our staff. I guess you got a point there because it's kind of hard to walk away from Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas all year long is very positive. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. The within uh, within Frankenmuth, and especially with with Bronner's and the and the reopening of your store. How closely have you been working with the city to, you know, to help get the message out that's out there, to making sure that you're complying with all the regulations? What is what is that relationship like? The the Chamber of Commerce actually has done a tremendous job. They have a unified uh, effort here, a unified force for representing Frankenmuth, and we've partaken of that almost literally. And you're going to see a lot of Frankenmuth oriented stickers on the floor and throughout the throughout their establishment. When I actually came in today for the interview, there's a sign that's hanging on your door out here at the south entrance, probably on all of your entrances. Yes. But that sign that's hanging out there, I've actually seen that on almost every single restaurant that I've walked into in Frankenmuth. So, yeah, when you say that there's there's a real concerted effort going on, there certainly is. Yeah, we want to represent Frankenmuth as being one entity. Hey everyone, Cliff here. Don't go anywhere just yet. Coming up, Wayne is going to share with us his future plan for Bronner's how they brought Bronner's into the internet age, and where in the world do they get all these lovely Christmas decorations. But first, let's take a moment and thank our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by the Frankenmuth Convention and Visitors Bureau. German architecture, chicken dinners, and the world's largest Christmas store are just the beginning. Frankenmuth is quickly becoming known for so much more than chicken and Christmas. From trendy dining to timeless horse-drawn carriage rides, Kayaking to adventure parks, ballparks, water parks, regular parks, sweet Moses, there's a lot to do in one trip to Frankenmuth. Visit the must sees of Little Bavaria, then grab your crew and find something new waiting to be discovered. Pack a picnic blanket, order takeout from your favorite place, and let your kids delight in exploring while soaking up the little moments in life. Join the generations of families in our hotels during the 175th anniversary season in 2020. The perfect road trip awaits you. Start planning your unforgettable family vacation at frankenmuth.org. Now, back to the show. Excellent. What is your plan for for Bronner's going into the future? To keep things going, keep things on a steady track. So we've been successful, been blessed for many, many years. We want to continue to be blessed for many years going into the future. Excellent. So we really don't have anything serious, any, any change in dynamics and so forth. We have expanded. We have an Internet presence and a catalog presence. A lot of people aren't aware of that. We're going to peak out about 750 people on the payroll every year, and about 200 of those work on the, the fulfillment end of things, and they're shipping out orders and so forth all across the United States and around the world. Wow, and you're right because I didn't even think about the fact that you guys have an online catalog. Yes, we do. We we actually print about three million catalogs per year, in addition to an online presence. We mail them to likely prospects. Let's say it's oh Sacramento, California, and it's right after Labor Day, and the last thing on their mind is Christmas. Kids are back in school and they're playing soccer and so forth. All of a sudden, this catalog comes through the mailbox. Hmm, that'd be good for Uncle Jim, and this is perfect for Aunt Betty and so forth. So they place their orders accordingly. Well, that still cracks me up, thinking about Christmas in the middle of summer. That's cool. That's great. The With regards to this being a, a literally like a multi-generational business, 
Is there any of your kids that are thinking about one day they're gonna they're gonna take over working here? Yeah, we we actually have the third generation involved. That's my son Dietrich. He's uh, forty years old right now and been working with us for probably ten years. Excellent. And this is truly you really will be a multi generational business. Correct. Oh, that is so cool. What is when you're when you're working with uh, Dietrich on the floor? What are some of the things that you share with him about the philosophy about? running a successful business? Well, the the answer is that visitors spend a lot of money to come here. They're coming, by and large, from the suburbs of Detroit, so forth, so they, they've given us a whole day of their time and many miles to drive to get here. And they walk through our door to choose from 50,000 different things, not one of which they need, but a lot of which they want. <laughs> so we, we have to constantly keep that in mind. Right. Excellent. And with your with your inventory, because I know you said before about a, maybe approximately about a third of your inventory. Correct. Is, we is, change every year. Yes. Change every year. Yes. What is it that drives your decision about what types of, of Christmas memorabilia to have in the store? We just take a look at what's on the market, what's hot and so forth, and change accordingly. Oh, excellent. Is there any places that you that you particularly look at? Like if, if you know, you're going out there and doing your research, is there, you know, a particular store or you got people that pay attention to social media? Yeah, you know, we travel around the globe, so it's it's a matter of perception and so forth, taking all the thoughts and all the reactions and so forth and putting them all together and making our buying decisions accordingly. And that has got to be the funnest job in the world, traveling <laughs> the world to see how people are thinking about spending Christmas and what they're what they're doing, what they're buying. That's true, yes. Yeah. We go to a European show, it's called Christmas World. It's in Frankfurt, Germany, and people come from around the world to exhibit their wares there. So we do a lot of shopping at Frankfurt, Germany. As We go to Asia as well. And, and domestically, we go to Atlanta. That's a, a huge, huge market. There's a lot of, a lot of merchandise that's available for sale, and we pick up our Christmas receptions there. Excellent. So between Atlanta, Frankfurt, and Asia, which is interesting. Well, I know that Asia is like the heart of manufacturing, but as far as like Christmas stuff goes, that's actually interesting. The, the Asian, they have a big trade show. Now, we're, we're large enough, actually, we go to the individual suppliers. So rather than buying through middlemen and so forth, we buy direct. Oh, I understand how so it works. So we're going right okay. to the factories. So there's no just-in-time delivery for Christmas items. We have to order by the container. But if you want Christmas lights and so forth, they're all made in Asia. Nice. Okay. The 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 festival that's in Frankfurt, how big is that? The, that's the probably trajectory. one of uh, 12 buildings. The length of, that, of the complex is probably three-quarters of a mile. So it's a very big, big show. How long does it take you to go through all that? <laughs> well, we have about three days, and we have many different buyers and so forth that we take along for the trip. Holy sweet Moses. And then from there, that's how you make your decision about what you're going to stock in the shelves. Correct. We do a lot of buying over there. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. The Wow. And you said about a third of your staff is dedicated just to fulfillment and warehouse? About 200 people, yes, yeah. We ship, there's, there's days uh, the UPS will pick up four to 5,000 packages. Oh, sweet Moses. And is that all done here on the property, or do you have a separate building That's for all that? done right here, right here. We have a call center. We have 36 operators and so forth. They're just uh, aggressive, and they're going to take your call. Wow, that, that really is impressive. If, if people want to follow what it is that you're doing, or, or, you know, learn more about Bronner's or whatever it is, what would be the best way for them to do that? Probably you know, go on our website. You're going to pick up a good flavor of Bronner's, what Bronner's is all about. There's many different facets on there, so you can get a good experience of what, what Bronner's involves. Excellent. And for our audience, we will have those links in the show notes down below. Wayne, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Hey, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, then subscribe to our email newsletter. When you subscribe, you'll get new episode announcements. You'll get all kinds of great behind the scenes information on upcoming guests. Plus, you'll receive special offers from our guests and partners that you can only get through the email newsletter. Subscribing is quick, easy, and best of all, it is free. Just go to callofleadership.com slash email, type in your email address, and you're done. Once again, that's callofleadership.com slash email. I'll catch you in the next episode.